I want to thank the forum, not only for hosting us today and pulling together such a terrific and diverse group of people to have this conversation about the outlook for the United States, but in this particular case, I think they've really nailed it with the framing of this panel, uh, which is very short and sweet and simple. What can Washington actually get done uh, in the next two years, the final two years of uh, President Obama's tenure in Washington? I think that's a great starting point for this conversation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what everyone has to say and where we agree, and especially where we disagree. Um, just this week, of course, President Obama gave his State of the Union address, and he had a fairly ambitious uh, agenda of proposals. Uh, just as quickly, I think there was a conversation both in Washington and around the world about what's really possible in the context of a new Republican-controlled Congress, and uh, what is that legislative agenda. So I'd like to start with that as our starting point. We have uh, Commerce Secretary Penny Prisker. Uh, I'll give you the right of uh, First refusal, as they say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> President Obama talked a big game. Uh, what do you think is going to emerge as the most actionable items that were in that State of the Union address? Well, let me preface answering the question by saying, where are we? And I think the first thing that the President was trying to communicate to all of us is that the American economy is in a good position. We ended up 2014 with GDP growing at about 5%, with uh, job growth, 3 million new jobs. Uh, the most job creation since the late 1990s, with the deficit down about two-thirds, with health care costs uh, uh, really moderating, with 10 million more Americans having health care coverage, and with record exports. Uh, 2013, about $2.3 trillion of exports, and it looks like in 2014 we'll beat that number. So the United States is sitting in a good position. Uh, from an economic standpoint. Of course, the President pointed out to all of us that we don't, middle class wages have not been rising and that we need to really address that as a challenge. And obviously, with unemployment coming down, with uh, opportunities rising, we can talk more about that as an agenda item. But in terms of a legislative agenda, the President laid out a number of things that I think are doable. First of all, trade agreements. Uh, we need to Pass, uh, and he was very explicit asking for trade promotion authority from Congress. And the, I believe that is doable. And the reason I believe it's doable is, is that once it's really understood that we're not talking about trade agreements of 20 years ago, we're talking about the situation today in the 21st century, it's really imperative for us to create a fair and level playing field for American businesses globally. You know, importing into the, or selling if you uh, bring your goods into the United States from a foreign country, you face about, on average, about a 1.5% tariff. But if you want to sell your goods from the United States, let's say autos or chemicals or agriculture, you could face anywhere from 30 to 100% tariff. And so this is about fairness, market access, level playing field. It's also about our values. How do we create trade around the world? where our uh, labor standards are more commensurate with the labor standards we have in the United States, environmental standards are high, where there's intellectual property protection. So this is an opportunity for America to lead in a place where I think there's common ground between the administration and the Republican Congress. Well, that's right. I was going to bring in Congressman uh, McHenry. This is one where you may have more trouble with Democrats uh, <coughs> in the president's own party than with Republicans. Are Republicans willing to give uh, President Obama a win on something that, that may be uh, supported by many Republicans, but nonetheless, this would count as a big legislative victory for him? Well, this is really about American, the American people and and jobs and uh, access to goods and services and be able to sell goods and services around the world. It's not a, a, a win for the president or a lose for this group or, or whatever else. It should be a win for the American people. Uh, Ambassador Froman's done a, a yeoman's task in working through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and, and so if you look, you know, certainly the Senate, the votes are there to pass trade promotion authority uh, as well as uh, uh, TPP. Um, but in the House, it's going to be uh, really uh, the, the duty for Republicans to carry the most weight on this. Um, and the president's going to have to do a, a major amount of lifting in order to bring even a, a portion of the Democrats in the House along. Uh, they're largely not free traders to any degree. I uh, have worked on this issue uh, with Ambassador Froman because of 
the nature of my district and, and the region, um, and also as a matter of making sure we have votes there uh, to pass uh, this trade agreement. It's important. So you uh, think but, you so have I, the votes on your side? Uh, we're going to work through that. <laughs> and we're committed to work through that. And the speaker has said that, that to, to the president as well. So I think trade is an area where we can work together. Mm -hmm. I do think that's real. I do that, think that's significant. Unfortunately for me, I heard the president talk through about half of his State of the Union was about issues that he knows are dead on arrival. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought up the same tax increase that he's been bringing up uh, when he had super majorities in the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate for, with his party. He couldn't get it passed then. He's certainly not going to get it passed with the Republican House. That's unfortunate. I wanted to hear him talk more about uh, comprehensive tax reform. Um, and I think that's doable. I think we can do some rational things when it comes to immigration, when it comes to high-skilled uh, visas, uh, and making sure that those that come to the United States for education can stay and work and be a, participate in our society. I think we can do some, uh, maybe not uh, all that the president desires on immigration, but we could probably get half of it done, two-thirds of it done in a bipartisan way without much controversy. I think we need to do that. I think we need to start on that when it comes to doing the right things uh, for border security, internal enforcement first, and then moving on uh, to uh, ag and high-tech uh, uh, workers. Uh, those are areas where I think we can work together. The other thing is infrastructure. Uh, and, and tax reform can be uh, paid for uh, to ensure that we have modern infrastructure and so we could be more competitive around the globe. I think that's really sh that should be the agenda. And the final piece, of course, is regulation. Um, what we see is, after this last election, 70% uh, of the state legislative chambers in America are controlled by Republicans. A majority of governors are Republicans. You're seeing uh, Democrat and Republican governors as incubators for ideas when it comes to regulation. Washington needs to catch up. Our securities laws need to catch up. Our, our uh, uh, regulations and rules for businesses um, and need to catch up. And I think that can uh, add, uh, add more oomph to uh, this uh, nascent recovery we have. I want to come back to the Republican Congress and how it's going to be different uh, than the last Congress was. But you've invoked a governor, a Democratic governor, as, a, as the case may be here. Do you, do you agree uh, that uh, the initiative has passed from Washington to the states in some ways? Well, in certain places where we've had just, you know, dysfunction and, and log jams, immigration, I mean, a lot of the, what now look, we can be optimistic about, and, and I haven't met a governor yet who's not incurably optimistic uh, by nature, but, but governors are much less partisan, and we generally do work together, uh, and I think are committed to, you know, trying within the governors, the, the National Governors Association is working towards trying to, all right, is there a, a place in immigration that governors can get behind? Uh, can we support the Export-Import Bank? If you really want to expand exports, how do we make sure that we governors come to a consensus and then we talk to our congressional representatives of both parties and say, you know, this is going to be long-term, help us uh, be able to do more exports. So those kinds of things. Uh, governors also, I mean, we've got to get stuff done. So we sit with the uh, cabinet members or with the president himself. I was out there a couple weeks ago. And he was very forthright that, that he would do everything he could to cut red tape and regulation, bureaucracy, that if we were willing to build infrastructure, one way to build more would be to be able to build it faster. Instead of having every permit process go in a sequential one after the other, do a whole series of, of permitting uh, processes or uh, parts of a permit process, do them parallel and cut what would take five years or seven years down to one and a half years, that saves you money, it makes the project go faster, gets you better pricing, and, and you're able to build more infrastructure for the same money. And, uh, I think if we do a few of these projects, I think that uh, hopefully that'll you know, stimulate uh, Congress. Although I think Congress, again, the optimist I am, I think Congress is going to work together. I, you know, I, you know, even immigration, I'm uh, quite hopeful that there'll be some, you know, a good compromise. Nobody's really happy. So right. we're going to come back next year, and we're going to have the conversation about, uh, about how that optimism played out. I want to get back to Colorado as a laboratory, arguably one of the most interesting uh, laboratories right now in the United States for policy experience. But I want to bring in first uh, uh, Andrew Liveris, who is operating in the real economy as opposed to the Washington uh, economy, <laughs> as, the, as the CEO of, of a huge uh, multinational corporation. 
First of all, do you, do you agree with these relatively rosy assessments of the U.S. economy at this point? And how much do you think that President Obama does or doesn't deserve credit for that? So um, I want to pick up from where Penny was with her assessment of the U.S. economy today. And um, if you think of the global economy in its various forms, the U.S. economy is the strongest, strongest engine on our aircraft of the global economy. The other engines aren't as strong. Some of them aren't actually even functioning at all, like in Europe, and that's a whole other topic. Um, that's not happened by accident. That's happened because of deliberate policies, and I, I give President Obama due credit for that. I've been CEO for 11 years, and six years of that has been under the Obama administration, and I've been going to Washington to be a participant in the policy conversation. I think CEOs today of U.S. global multinationals in particular, who are operating by different rules of the road around the world, have to really bring the highest standard to the conversation wherever those conversations take place. We have to participate in the trade conversations. We have to participate in the immigration discussion on human capital. We have to bring the very best standards that we learn over decades of operating, and in Dow's case, 118 years young, and to figure out how to bring those standards around the world so it's fair. And, and fairness, okay, versus free, fairness, okay, is because you've got dialogue in the policy setting process from the constituencies that matter. The regulators and the regulated. I mean, it's offset about Washington, it's not my quote, but I'll say it, it's funny. It, you know, you either go there because if you don't go there, you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Okay? <laughs> and, and literally, okay, <laughs> literally, Washington feels like that a lot. And I really like to say that where the tailwinds have occurred, with due credit to the administration, where the tailwinds are occurring in the United States, it is that a lot of the United States' inherent strengths, its workforce, its ability to have a mobile workforce, its education system, its entrepreneurialism, its freedoms, its immigration policies. These are its strengths. Now, what has happened is we play to those strengths and energy has become a major competitive advantage. And all of us with the economic crisis of 08, 09 have restructured because we've had the freedom to restructure. We've taken down our cost curves. We're globally competitive. We can export out of the United States. We've reskilled a lot of our workforce with a lot more work to do. That's all happening in the United States today, which is why the US is ahead of the world in what the world currently needs. A lot more work to do. And I think the, the question of the next two years, the politics of uncertainty that we saw over these last few years with the dysfunctionality of Congress and the administration in all of its various facets. Look, I was vice chair of the Business Roundtable, chair of the Business Council. We'd get people in and we'd ask for the centre to appear. Mm -hmm. That would start to go down from 20 people to 10 people with the various elections to a no people. The centre started to, fe uh, to disappear in, the, in Congress. And that became a problem. People would not take a stand on what compromise would look like. The politics of uncertainty leads to the economics of uncertainty. That's now behind us. I am full of hope that the business tax reform agenda the President laid out, the trade agenda the President laid out, immigration in its various forms can be done in this next year or two. That'll juice the American economy even further. We've got more headwinds and more work. I agree in the area of regulations. We're way over-regulated. So we need work in that area. Energy policy, I, I can't wait for the United States to finally put together an energy policy that works. But in the main, the United States is on the right track. And these next two years, with Congress and the way it is, in a strange sort of way, both, being, both houses being Republican, this is maybe the best chance we have to get the right outputs on policy. Cecilia, this is an oddly optimistic group. I'm, I'm quite amazed. Most <laughs> Washington conversations are not. As the dean of the Wilson School at Princeton, you, you have a little bit of a remove. Uh, this gap between our collective policy aspirations, the can-do ethic that you often see in the states or in cities uh, versus a sort of hopelessness that had set in around this pervasive sense of Washington gridlock. Do you, first of all, do you share this, this optimism that we're hearing today? And, and taking a longer view, what is your view as an academic about whether American politics has moved into some new phase of dysfunction or it's, or it's connected with the economy and the disruptions of recent years? Um, so a, as I was thinking about the panel, I kept thinking, this must be the shortest panel at Davos because <laughs> they're going to get nothing done. <laughs> but that was just a joke, right? I was just quipping <laughs> to myself. I think more seriously, I think part of the reason why there's, optim there's a little bit of optimism right now is because if you think about the incentives for the president, who obviously wants to be a president who got, he's 
accomplished a lot, a lot already, and he wants to have be known as a president that got a lot done. And then you have a Republican-controlled Congress, which, if they do nothing, will have been responsible for doing nothing, and they can't blame it on something else. And the fact that they don't have a veto-proof um, majority in the Senate. It means that if, in order for them both to get accomplish some goals, they have to work together, and they're going to have to find common ground somewhere. So I think because those incentives are aligned is part of the reason why there's some hope. And as we were talking about beforehand, it's also the last two Congresses have been the lowest performing Congresses since, what was it, World War II. So the bar's pretty low. There's nowhere to go but up. Um, does it bother you, Congressman, when people say the do-nothing Congress, the do-nothing Congress? Does that, does that bother you? I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> Doing um, something. No, it, it's a frustration of our system. And in the House of Representatives, just as an example, the Keystone Pipeline. <clears throat> I know the President's already said he's going to veto it. But we passed that in an afternoon in the House of Representatives, in an afternoon. The Senate took it up on the same day, which was their first week that they were in session. It will take them almost four weeks to pass that same bill or a similar bill. And on their first vote, they had 63 members agree to have the discussion on the Keystone Pipeline. And at the end of the day, they have 60 votes for the Keystone Pipeline. This is a widely agreed upon bill in the Senate, and this is moving quickly in the Senate. It's almost four weeks. So there's some frustration on that system. It is the system, though, that where we've had some of the greatest successes in American history. And to Cecilia's point on the divided government <coughs> opportunity here, we had uh, welfare reform, a balanced budget, and the biggest rewrite in telecom policy in 50 years done with a Republican House, Republican Senate, and a Democrat president in the 1990s. It is possible for us to do rational and good things for the American people, and it is incumbent upon us to act. That also means that instead of asking for 100%, whether it's the president or whether it's House Republicans or Senate Democrats or whatever group, we're going to have to work through to see what we can achieve and what we can agree upon. So I want to bring Cecilia back in the question, but I must say, having covered and lived through the uh, Washington of uh, President Clinton and divided government. I never thought that you would hear a Republican member of the leadership <laughs> <laughs> look back with nostalgia on those days as a legislative high watermark. Uh, it well, no, but j I mean, look at the production, <laughs> right? And then the president says, well, these Republicans are different than they were in the 1990s. I would remind you of what the Republican, uh, Republicans in the House did with Bill Clinton in 1998, right? And uh, we're not talking about that. It's not like there was some merry band of uh, camaraderie in the 1990s, right? Clearly not. So, I mean, yeah, No, but to your not. point that, that even people who violently disagree in the most personal of ways right. uh, can pass Right, and if you just read American history, we just love this fight in Washington. It's just part of the, part of the discussion. The frustration we have, though, uh, talking to the editor of Politico here, is that we know to the smallest degree... Uh, uh, to, to the microscopic level of what happens in debates. So if we didn't like Washington when we had only the evening news, imagine when you know play by play, moment by moment, how that sausage is made, right? And the American people like it even less because they know even more. Mm -hmm. And so that's a telltale lesson for me that we have to get things done. I'm glad the lesson isn't that we should know less. <laughs> <Right>. Cecilia. <laughs> I'm sorry, which part did you want to... I, no, I thought you wanted to jump back in on this question of uh, the inherent gridlock in the system or not. I, I mean, I have to admit that when it comes to how we've set up, um, you know, between the House and the Senate, which I think the, House, the Senate was designed to be a little bit more deliberative than the House, and it seems to me the House is always, is always working, but I think when we're thinking do nothing, we mean in terms of what actually gets passed. Um, I do think that there's, you asked from the academic side, there is some concern that in the U.S. Uh, that we, you know, part of it, if you look at our media, it's gotten more polarized um, and uh, that it, there's a feeling that our population's gotten more polarized and that there is less of an understanding and not just in Washington, but that this is coming from the bottom up and that that will have some consequences for our, for our, our, our you know, our, our, demo, our democracy. 
Um, that's a little bit gloom and doom, and I'm not saying that I think that we're you know about to cave under the you know the weight of Rome or something. But I think that there is some concern that that polarization is actually reflecting more of what's ha happening around the country. Governor Hickenlooper, you come from a state that uh, you know obviously is a pretty contested state politically. Uh, it's it's voted Democratic in national elections. It's it's elected you. Uh, it just elected a new Republican senator as well. Uh, from the ground up, from the battleground state, uh, if you will. Uh, do you see that gridlocked partisan outcomes in Washington are inevitable, or how do you how do you make policy that people can agree upon <coughs> when they disagree about so much uh, on their personal political views? Well, and part of it is the, the media is very polarizing, but I think go back and look at the time at Lincoln's reelection. You couldn't be any more polarizing than that. Right. Uh, there is a difference in the television, certainly, and, and all the visual media is, is a hot media. So. And, and the attack ads, you know, I'm, I'm fine. And Andrew's heard me say, I said this the other day, that you don't, Coca-Cola would never do an attack ad against Pepsi. Pepsi sales would go down. It works. Pepsi would have no choice but to attack Coke. Coke sales would go down. They'd attack Pepsi. Pepsi would attack Coke. You'd depress the entire product category of soft drinks. And what we're doing is, is depressing the product category of democracy in a, in a certain funny way. And I think the way, at least on a state basis, you do that, you respond to that, is you try to persuade people, and I think this is what Cece, if I can be so bold, uh, she said because she was called Cece Absolutely. growing up. The, uh, <laughs> but the, that uh, uh, trying to persuade people to see a broader self-interest for themselves than they originally thought. And you were describing the president and Congress both having an overlapping self-interest in getting things done. And I think on a local level, that's, you know, when you're trying to persuade someone, you just have to listen harder and, and, and focus more on what their real concern is, because often it's different than what you think. And this is years in the restaurant business, that all of a sudden you say, oh, that's your problem. Well, heck, I don't care that much about that, and maybe we can work on this. And, and you end up with, again, a compromise that's not perfect for everyone, but that where enough self-interest overlaps so that you can, you can make real progress. Secretary Prisker, what is it? Are, are you able to be in the solutions business while leading such a, a massive government agency right now? Absolutely. You know, remember, I come from the private sector, 27 years, my first government job. In the private sector, your job is to find solutions. Give me the facts, give me the lay of the land, and then I, your job is to figure out how to navigate. And I think what was, I, the reason that I'm optimistic is, is I think that there are overlapping self-interest, but there are also overlapping policy uh, positions at this point, and, and there's a desire to get things done. And I think there's a desire, and I think there's also a recognition that we should focus on where we can actually get things done. There's a, I, uh, some discipline going on. There may be, look, everyone's got their rhetoric and their political rhetoric, which is not my expertise. But in fact, if you listen carefully to where there's overlapping interests, you're seeing real progress happen. I think you'll see the trade agreements start to move uh, in very short order. There's work going on to see if we can have business tax reform. And I, you don't hear the kind of negative conversation. There's realistic conversation. These are challenging issues to resolve, and they require uh, uh, people to stake out what's important to them. The president's tried to do that on business tax reform. I think the Republican House and Senate are doing the same looking for ways, is there enough overlap that we can make a deal? Because the American people want to see progress. They want to see the United States remain competitive, remain a leader in the global economy. Why? They want jobs. They want to do better. That's the number one. If you look at all the polling, what does it tell you? Americans want jobs. They want an opportunity. They want to believe that they can do better for their families. And that's our job, is to figure that out. And I think there's more listening that's going on, as the governor said, and said, you know what, Let, yes, there's rhetoric, and yes, there might be things that are said on either side that are being said for various political reasons. But there's also a lot of listening going on as to where the overlap is, and I, that's why I'm hopeful. It's a window, too. We will get into, ultimately, the national elections, and that will change the landscape uh, for the congressman and for the administration. And so we have to take advantage of the window that we've got. And that's why I also think there's a sense of urgency that I hear from the congressman is, let's take advantage of this moment. Let's focus on the things that we can actually get done. So the, so. Pa the, patient is, the patient is still not well, okay? 
So let, let's, mm -hmm. I, this I, was my I, this question. optimism point that you were at before, I think the US has gotten itself into a position to get well. Mm -hmm. uh, 3% GDP growth we should not be celebrating. This economy's got a way more promise than that. The trade agreements and business tax reform will accelerate GDP. They have to be done. Unemployment rate's coming down, but there's a lot of people who've never worked. We've got to reskill the workforce big time. There are open jobs, Penny and I were chatting in the corridor, five million of them. Um, I can't get a welder to build plants in the United States without paying them $200,000 a year. Maybe that's what I should be paying them. 20% wage inflation in, in the technician area on the US Gulf Coast last year. Um, but we have unemployed people, so we've got to get reskilling done. It is a major issue that'll create growth. We've got to get at that work. It is jobs. You get re-elected on jobs, you'll get elected on jobs. The states work because the states have had some more. In fact, we've gone to the states preferentially the last three or four years, like you know, Colorado. How much do you think that this inequality uh, issue in, in, in the American economy, does that affect your business in some real way? It affects my business because I can't get workers. Mm -hmm. This is, this is absolutely ludicrous. So, so to that point, this yeah. was not much ballyhooed last year, but a Republican House, a Democrat Senate, and a Democrat president yeah. uh, cut the number of worker training programs we had, took the money, and threw it a, in, a, in more focused ways. It was a huge success. Exactly. I know, Penny, that you were very engaged in that. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the type of success that doesn't make headlines, but that's the real work that we've got to do. That's and that's a matter of finding that, that little opening that you right. can do something small but significant. Tangible. I think you're exactly and right. It's very <clears throat> tangible and focusing is really, I think, that the critical factor here. Let's not boil the ocean. Let's not try and get everything mm -hmm. done. Let's focus where we can have bi the biggest impact. And the skilled workforce, I mean, you've got a group of people here who are very focused on skilled workforce. I mean, Cecilia and I got first met one another when we did a set of focus groups on that ultimately led to creating Skills for America's Future, which ra really raised the awareness of the skills challenge that we're facing today. We have five million open jobs in America. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. We know today that in 2020, 35% of our workforce needs to have a BA in order to do the jobs that our business leadership is telling us they're going to have. We know another 30% need to have the technical skills and need to have at least some form of higher education. We're nowhere near meeting those needs. It's a real issue. The solutions, though, actually <clears throat> reside in the states and in the cities and in the regions. The federal government, what we can do together, which we did, was to really change the way grants work so that they're business-led and job-driven. So they're focused on, it's not about we're just gonna give out money for training and pray that it's somehow it works, but instead it's focused. And that's where working together shows progress and the congressman can go back to his district. I was in the Charlotte area, in fact, earlier this week, you know, and basically tout, hey, look, this is how government can actually function and work well together. And the employers can look and say, hey, look, this is working for me in the district. And this question of skills, goes right back to what you, you raised in the opening, which is uh, the middle class family, the median family in America has been left behind. Mm -hmm. The median wage for, uh, in, in our country is the same last year as it was in 1989, right? So they've been left behind by the great advances of the 90s and the, the first decade of the 2000s. And what is that big differentiation in the workforce? Skills, skills. And I say this uh, with all due respect as a, uh, uh, as a history major in, mm -hmm. in college. Well, we, can, right? we can retrain you too. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> no. You already have. Right? So a welder, it, what is fascinating to me is somebody with skills. like He's like going to sign up for your welding job. That's, that's higher paid Before than that, congressman. Exactly. And um, that might be based on delivery, actually. <laughs> so, so that point, though, we need to focus on skills. And some, and some of us, as Republicans, we see the workplace flexibility piece as very essential for middle-class families. Exactly. When the president brings up child care, it is a big issue for me with a five-month-old, by the way, named Cecilia, <laughs> um, at home, Cece. and the struggles that families have. And my wife has a, a very good job and has done a fantastic, has a fantastic career. So we're, we're very blessed, but it is a struggle. It's a real struggle for families. So there are opportunities where we can figure out this path forward 
to get at this major issue that is a societal problem mm -hmm. and not a Republican or Democrat problem, just a America. family problem of, in a country problem. So I want to bring the audience into it because I know you are going to have great contributions to make as well. I believe there's microphones uh, around. So if you just uh, raise your hands, do make it a question and make it quick so we can get as many people uh, out, go behind me. <laughs> well, uh, when, when you talk about trade, what what, Can you what identify is, yourself? Uh, I'm Alberto Bello. I come from Mexico, Grupo Expansión. What, when you talk about trade, what kind of what 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 agreements are you talking about? Uh, TPP, Europe. What what is when do you, when do you think that Congress would pass a trade agenda? Let's talk about the sequencing of the trade agenda. The first thing that needs to happen is trade promotion authority, uh, which is the opportunity where Congress basically says, look, here's what's important to Congress that's in the trade agreements. That, I think, is going, you're going to see action in Congress, I think, very quickly on that, uh, meaning we'll see bills start to come out. And uh, then you'll see TPP is the most ripe. Uh, and obviously, Mexico is participating in the TPP negotiations. Your uh, Minister of Economy is here. Minister of Trade is here, in fact. Uh, and we're working very closely together to get that completed. And obviously, our U.S. trade rep is leading the charge in terms of those negotiations. But there's really political... I, I see, having traveled to most of the TPP countries in the last year, there's real political will to get them done, but there's real also economic necessity for all of these countries. They see what is going to happen if this doesn't come to fruition. And so there's a navigation that has to happen in terms of, one, get the deals completed, two, get them in a position where they can, in each of the countries, be ratified. And I think that's the next thing that you'll see. In the meantime, TPP is being negotiated. It's not as ripe a deal TTIP. as, uh, excuse me, TTIP, TTIP as TPP. So the European <coughs> negotiation will, come, will finish up later. And probably you'll see that in 2016. So that's the lineup of the trade agreements. What's really important to keep in mind, these agreements are what will are part of the plan that will continue to keep America growing strong. TPP, for, the White House estimates TPP will uh, produce about 650,000 jobs for America. And it, it has, you know, benefit for the other countries as well. So this is something that's not just about, uh, it's a nice to have. This is a need to have for us to stay com globally competitive. Let me get another question. Right here, sir. My name is Drew Welton. My name is Drew Welton. I'm an American living in Switzerland. Um, Tax reform on, 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 a, on a personal level, isn't that a, a, a big way to move the needle in, in, in the states in order to have equalization of tax from the rich and the poor and have enough uh, revenue to, to move the programs in terms of education, in terms of, of retooling people? That's sort of something, a topic that the taxes are so complicated. On the one hand, you said that you thought it was something that might be on the agenda. On the other hand, you said President Obama's uh, tax statement in his State of the Union was dead on arrival. It was, it was uh, he, he's asked for it since he ran the first time. <clears throat> the president got the tax increases he desired out of the, the uh, uh, sort of larger agreement uh, two years ago. Um, so to come back for a, an additional tax increase, I think is not the right approach. But actually going back and taking out, uh, uh, well, we've got a very complicated, messy tax code, period. Um, so we need to actually think of our tax code as a matter of competitiveness. Right, but that isn't just business. Uh, question of corporations and their taxation and their top rate and uh, all their uh, littering of uh, exclusions and loopholes, but it's also at the personal level. Uh, the personal level actually affects my district more than the corporate tax rate because small business folks largely file as individuals. I think we need to do this in tandem, and that is my hope. And um, the, the administration will put force behind it. But if you look at the 1986 tax reform. Um, it, it took the full weight of the White House and the presidency and a Herculean effort in a divided Congress. And it was able to get done, but it was very messy. Um, it's going to take that type of level and engagement from the president uh, all the way down to rank and file members of the House and Senate to get this done. But the reality is, the, you know, Bowles Simpson 
entitlement and tax, that package is not going to happen this next two years. Would you agree with that? Well, those are so. So just doing tax reform alone, I know, that's what I'm saying, is a generational. But, but it's a left hand, goal. right hand thing, yes. Yeah, so. Right. But the question on entitlements, the president has already said he wouldn't go there. Right. Uh, the Speaker of the House, uh, John Boehner, offered, uh, offered the president a package uh, three years ago, yeah. and the president rejected that. We've already seen that. We read quite a bit about it in Politico. Um, so the president I, I, has not been serious about entitlement reform. Um, I was trying to focus on what we can achieve, but it, it seems to be the president is not in, interested in doing that. When I see this president as having a huge opportunity to fix a huge challenge for the next generation. My, my generation is the first that will have a bankrupt social security system. It is not responsible to the next generation to leave them indebted with a social safety net that is completely tattered. So I, I think it's a moral imperative. Well, certainly, the, the, just to finish the tax th thing, the, I think what the president's looking at that he can do is, is some corporate reforming of tax and certainly uh, making us more competitive with the rest of the world while at the same time allowing large multinationals to bring some of those, that $2 trillion back into the country and use the, the revenues from that to invest in infrastructure, whether you're talking about highways, you know, uh, physical infrastructure or higher, higher education. I mean, that's something that should be doable. Is there something? demand in the states? I mean, do you feel like people are saying to you, we wish Washington would get this tax? Absolutely. I mean, I think that there is a need for infrastructure in this country that cuts right across partisan divides. Uh, Republican governors, Democratic governors, we all need, we have, we're, we're getting, you know, congestion in our, in our urban areas. <clears throat> we're, our broadband is not in every place that it should be. I mean, this is all stuff that allows states and therefore our country to be competitive with the rest of the world. There's two words that haven't been used in the business tax reform that everyone's got to remember makes this very hard. That's revenue neutral. So as soon as you go to any business community, and I'm a member, uh, <laughs> K Street kicks into gear. So all these... They already have. It's, we, we had yeah, a story yeah. today that said that uh, well, that's where I'm going. companies hiring tax lobbyists last year was a record boom year. So the business community has got to be unified in saying this is good overall. Okay? Right. Because if the pie is just being redivided, there's no expansion of the pie, there's no growth, then this will never happen. And this is the issue in Europe too. So this has got to be for the greater good, and that takes a lot of work. And that's why I think it's already a hard enough exercise to get revenue new neutral business tax reform that then will lead to the benefit the governor was talking about. I know you want to jump in, Secretary Prisker, and then I want to make sure we get some other questions. Well, I just want to, I think what you're hearing here is, is exactly kind of the, uh, the situation that we're faced with, right? I think everyone wants to see this happen, but you've got, uh, the business community has really got to recognize that in the short run, there are going to be winners and losers. And if everybody, and what the president has talked, I know, with Senator McConnell about is the fact, look, if everybody, all the businesses gear up their lobbyists, then you can, you can make sure that business tax reform doesn't happen. We have to, though, the congressman is absolutely right. This is about global competitiveness. And what the leadership, I think, both in the administration and on the Hill recognizes, and I've heard this from, I've been 18 months roughly in my job. I've probably talked to 1,500 or 1,600 business leaders around the United States. They all want business tax reform. The question is, can we find a way to navigate it where we don't end up, everybody tears it apart, and it becomes politically unfeasible? And that's going to be the real trick. Question. Yes. Greg Shai from ABB. Uh, hello there. Uh, question is uh, around energy policy. Uh, we talked about getting things moving, being practical, finding compromise. For many years, there's been a big need for energy policy reform and having clear guidelines that allow for more investment, more jobs, building out the infrastructure that needs help, uh, especially in the U.S. So uh, any comments on where that fits on the agenda, what kind of priority, uh, what we can expect? Well, I, I've already this said... This is also your agenda. I've already said, I mean, I, this has been my holy grail for 11 years. I haven't succeeded. So I, um, I would say it's in the too hard basket for the next two years, but... There are pieces of it getting into place. So natural gas and shale gas and how that gets not just extracted safely, but enhanced domestically and exported. That, that's a real big value chain I just described. 
That's no. a big chunk in Colorado. Maybe you'll get to it in a second. But the completeness of the question means you have to bring efficiency standards across the country into, into shape. That's a combination of federal and state. And that's a big, big bucket. Not just auto, housing, appliances, building. I mean, the BTU we burn, okay, is one thing. The BTU we don't use is the better one, right? That's mm -hmm. emission control, everything. Alternatives and the right alternatives and a transition on fossil fuels. You can't go zero, so a transition through shale gas, you know, basically C1. I mean, that, that's the sort of uh, energy policy we need. We haven't pulled it together as a country yet, and that would be one of my aspirations. Politically, Sorry. this has been very controversial in Colorado. Well, the <laughs> innovations in how you get shale gas, so horizontal drilling and hydraulic mm. fracturing, has been controversial because it, this, these new innovations allow exploration and production to come much closer to where people live, especially yeah. in the West. But, I mean, New York, Pennsylvania, they're all dealing with the issue. We've worked very hard to say, all right, our job is to make sure it's an industrial process, but we're going to regulate it to make sure that people aren't put at a disadvantage so that we, we were the first state to do methane regulation. But it, the key was we, we took the environmental community, the leaders, the Environmental Defense Fund, some of the top environmental experts, and got them in the room with the leadership of the oil and gas industry. And you know, we were the convener and sometimes the peacemaker, but that's how we got to regulations that no red tape. We, we tried to make sure every dollar that was spent would actually make the air cleaner. And we had both sides at the end. When we announced our methane regulation, we had the environmental community and the oil and gas industry side by side saying this is, this is good policy. And I think that's the, the, the last step, at least on a state basis, is we need to get the sides together, put down their weapons, and, and work out the, again, the compromise that doesn't, it's not perfect for anyone. And as, uh, as Andrew said, that there is, I mean, natural gas is inexpensive. It's much cleaner than many of the fuels we're, we're burning now. It allows us, to, I mean, in terms of retraining, uh, it allows us a whole giant doorway of, of, of new jobs that we can train for. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the question is, we just have to put in the effort and the work to get to those regulations on, you know, ac across, the, across the country. Well, it's not, it's not political poison is what you found as a Democrat to support fracking. Well, I think we, we support it with, we, we were, in Colorado, we're trying to be as pro-business as we can, but with the highest standards. So we said, we're going to hold ourselves to cleaner air, cleaner water. We raised the fine for, for companies that polluted you know, frac fluid or, or crude oil got, got into the waterways, instead of a $500 a day fund, finally we went up to a, up a $15,000 a day fine. And suddenly we had less issues of, of, you know, careless mistakes. I think that's what the public expects, right? Our, our job is not to harass or, or, or one industry or another. Our job is to make sure that, that our environment, nothing stays the same. So we've got to be trying to make it a little cleaner every year. And in this way, this is, this is the state's acting. Um, when the federal government has not had uh, sort of wise longer-term policies when it comes to energy policy. So you have energy policy being led by various different states that are trying to well regulate new technologies, but also use it, utilize it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's sort of the trade-off. We all acknowledge that regulations have expenses, but we also want to have clean air and clean water. And the choices we make, whether it's living in Colorado or in Western North Carolina, you're making a choice to be there based off the environment, right. largely. Sure. Um, so we want to make sure we protect it, but also utilize the resources that we have. And obviously, your state's benefiting uh, greatly. Colorado's benefiting greatly from the revenue sources there. Uh, um, <clears throat> we're not going to get into the discussion on marijuana, but I'm uh, amazed uh, no one's brought it up. But really. but the, the, the resources training. you have in, That's in, the new economy. in the ground. In the well, but, but I think the key here, and as states by state, as states are the laboratory of innovation, and, right. and each state is grappling with how do we make our air and our water cleaner. We are, I think, the governors. I mean, we, the National Governors Association, the Western Governors Association, are working towards uh, a set of regulations around oil and gas that we can all adopt. And at that point, then we sit down with the federal government and say, all right, here's what this kind of standard would look like. And I but think a that's national a, energy policy is missing. Exactly. It is it is desperately needed. Desperately needed so important and we have real competitive Critical. challenges when you see China Critical. moving forward with nuclear and yet it's a, it's a you know a, a more than a decade long process yes. and almost impossible to get new nuclear online in the United States. Well it, it is I mean functionally it is impossible it hasn't happened uh, you know in decades. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you brought up the marijuana thing. I just have one question. <laughs> I just have one question. <laughs> Tell us about the economic uh, uh, effects of this. Has it been good for Colorado's economy to have been the, sort of leading the way in, in experimenting with a legal marijuana economy? Well, as I always say, I opposed it, just so we're clear. No, I, was, I wanted to say <clears throat> that too. Yeah. And after the, uh, it passed 55-45, so we said that's the will of the voters. Our job is to implement that. Uh, I think we're, tax revenue this year, in 2014, was almost $70 million. No state should ever do it for the tax revenue. I think the, the, the challenge is to make sure, again, that we have a, we're creating a regulatory framework from scratch. It's no fun. Uh, our, our evidence after now, we're one year into selling legal recreational marijuana, is that the people that were not smoking it before still aren't smoking it. The people that were smoking it before still are smoking it, but they are paying taxes. Uh, we're still very worried about kids. I think that that is a big question mark. Tourists come New York out. New Times columnists, they get in trouble. <laughs> Marine Dowd, that was a funny column. Uh, maybe not perfect for the brand of Colorado that I'm trying to create is this pro-business, you know, high accountability. Well, high accountability gets interpreted in a different way. It's in trouble. Um, but anyway, it, it certainly is a, it's a, it's a steep hill in terms of how, we, uh, how the world looks at Colorado. Uh, but it is, you know, it's something that we're making progress on, and I think the regulatory framework that we have the foundation built, and we'll see in a couple of years, we'll, we'll have enough evidence to, I think, make a much better assessment. Is this something, I mean, I always tell people it's, the, it's going to be one of the great social experiments of the 21st century, and we'll, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. Has that revenue, that $70 million, was that more or less than was projected? Well, we took a guess. We had no, there, no one's ever done this no, before, so we didn't. <laughs> we thought, the, I think our projections were at one time $120 million, uh, but we, they were wild guesses. Uh, you know, our, our general fund budget is $11 billion, mm -hmm. so uh, $100 million is not a big deal. If you include all the federal uh, revenues and the uh, fees that people pay, I mean, all the stuff that comes through, we've got a $26 billion budget. Again, it's a small, there's, you shouldn't do this because you think it's, it's going to be a windfall. Money. It's not about money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't think states or cities or anyone should be promoting gambling. If, that's, if you get revenue off gambling, you know the gambling's not good for people. It doesn't go into a casino and see whether people are really joyful when they're pulling those slot machines, right? But, I mean, it's freedom, and I, th I do believe that people should have their, you know, if they want to gamble, they can go gamble. If they want to, you know, in many things, and that's, that's the fine line, People should have the freedom to, to pursue what their desires, but we should also be very clear and transparent about what the risks are and, and what the consequences can be. So we have time for a few more questions, I think, from the audience. Try to get to places we haven't been. I, can, can I just go to this so that she, we get a new newcomer to the questions? <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that marijuana question. Thank you. Um, I'm Alil Alvarez. I'm a tax attorney from Mexico. So, of course, we're very much interested in what's happening in Colorado. And I wanted to ask you, besides um, the income increase, have you seen any decrease in expenses? Uh, around the marijuana? Exactly. Uh, uh, we haven't. Uh, it's probably too early to tell. I think that's a, a trailing indicator. Uh, and we do recognize the impact, and we've had a lot of visitors from Mexico who are very concerned. Uh, we're actually, next October, we're going to have the first, what we call the North American Summit. So we're going to have all the governors of Mexico, all the governors of the United States, all the premiers of Canada meet in, in Colorado Springs and look at some of these issues, uh, not just uh, marijuana. Obviously, that'll be discussed, but uh, I, it gets discussed always. But, but trade and immigration and a bunch of these issues that are common. Uh, and I think that's, as more regions Again, it's all about creating relationships so that you can begin to broaden self-interest. And as you broaden those self-interests, overlap occurs, and then you have transactions. You have progress. And certainly, Mexico uh, is a neighbor that, and, and Canada are both neighbors that I think we haven't put enough energy into. So I want to exercise the moderator's prerogative before we end, too. You, you brought up this window that we have before we turn full-fledged into uh, election politics in 2016. And the truth is, although it's only January of 2015, uh, we're rapidly turning in that direction. So I want to ask uh, everybody uh, on this panel to give this group uh, some of your best educated guesses. Uh, 
you know, and both parties. Uh, is it going to be Hillary Clinton versus Hillary Clinton in the uh, Democratic field? Uh, do you think she'll get the nomination? Who do you think in this? I, apparently, everyone is running for president in the Republican <laughs> field. Are you going to throw your hat in the ring, too, Congressman? Uh, I will announce today. Uh, no, there's no chance. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, uh, come on. <clears throat> no, um, no I, it, it's true that somebody said, well, you could field a football team with just the Republican candidates on both sides, right? Yeah. Um, with a deep bent. <laughs> yes. Um, a lot's yet to be seen. I mean, it, what's shaking out right now is just fascinating. And uh, it's great reading at, for us political junkies. Uh, but, I, you know, I think there are uh, a few candidates that will be in the mix. Um, certainly, you know, the tensions on Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney. But I think you have an, another group of, of uh, whether it's Rick Perry or, or Scott Walker, um, it, governors coming forward, or a Rand Paul, uh, who is an interesting voice in his own right and has a very unique perspective. Uh, th they're adding, uh, I think that, that, that will add a, a more interesting mix to this field uh, that is substantive. And Hillary Clinton uh, is the nominee? I think you'll have an enterprising liberal look at the opportunity uh, to actually make this a little more interesting. Uh, and I don't, I, I, I would, I'm hard pressed to think that she goes through this scot free. Cecilia, what do you think? Um, on the Hillary Clinton question. Yeah, okay. and the Republicans. Who, who, what's um, your forecast? Oh, God. <laughs> so I, I think I agree on the Democratic side that I think it would be surprising if she went forward by herself. And I think it's actually not good for us to have a Democratic primary that's, that goes unchallenged because I think a lot gets ironed out then. Um, on the Republican side, she's. Um, it'll be interesting no matter who, who puts themselves forward, although I think I'm um, just sort of looping back around to the pressures and what might get done. I think that if Jeb Bush ends up being the nominee, immigration becomes a lot more interesting, and I think that there will be a little more pressure to get that done. Secretary Pritzker. You know, the president gave us a uh, card about uh, that, you know, he's quite a sportsman, quite a competitor, and someone uh, who uh, enjoys watching sports. And it, as his cabinet is well aware, and I'm well aware, we're in the fourth quarter of his presidency, and a lot happens in the fourth quarter in most games. <laughs> so we're stayed focused on what we can get done right now. You know, you're in the cabinet, so I'll let you go with that answer, but we'll have to come back to you when you're done for the real answer. I want the same pass before the same result. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I mean, no, I mean, uh, you well, you're just, just in pundit mode. It's okay. You're no, not. No, because you know. uh, I, there's something wrong with, with the way we think about the president we should have or want to have versus the one we do have. And business hates this. I mean, we, we, we fourth quarter, actually, I wish you would say nowhere near the fourth quarter because the, we've got so much to get done. Yeah, here we are, and the media That's just. just yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I get it, Penny. So I, I'm, I, I just, I hate the way that the Washington just moves and pivots immediately to this, this mode that, you know, sorry, Politico and others sort of get us in. And here we are talking about this future that we wish is going to be better and, and sort of through these candidate names, and they're, they're the same names. If, if you ask me, yeah, I don't know who to blame. I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> well, why do we keep talking this up when we realize that the very issues of the day, jobs and the income inequality issue, the energy policy issue, <laughs> are not being tackled. And so I'd rather get the performance. I could judge on performance. I get voted in every day. If, if I don't perform, I'm out, OK? I think that accountability has to be there for our politicians. Perform, OK, deliver, and then you get reelected. Who, who wants a second term anyway? You know, literally, these jobs are not, I don't know, God bless you guys. I mean, second, you know, what you go through to get reelected, no one should have to go through. You so we're gonna the, we're gonna end up with Governor Hickenlooper, yeah. and I think that's the end of our show. One little data point that's interesting: yeah. actually, we're slower starting in this presidential campaign. In two thousand and eight, uh, when uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama ran against each other, it was actually the anniversary was this past week of when Hillary Clinton. Uh, announced that she was uh, exploring her candidacy. So in many ways, interestingly enough, some of the lessons have been learned. If you look at the calendar in, that Republicans are pushing for 2016, it, it's somewhat behind where it was in the past. I, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest uh, in this subject already, but I do yeah. think it's interesting that structurally there's an understanding, uh, you know, that there were some, some problems with how it, it unfolded in the last two races. 
So we're left with you, Governor Hickenlooper, uh, Hillary Clinton, or somebody else. Are you throwing your hat in the ring? <laughs> no, I think after after my reelection, someone asked, and I, th I put the odds that, that I would run for president at about one in twenty thousand, and I've had some time to reconsider that, and I think it's more like one in thirty-five thousand. I think I've reconsidered. I, I do think that there there will be other Democrats. I think uh, uh, I know Martin O'Malley has spent a lot of time looking at it, and he's been a uh, you know gotten a lot accomplished as a governor. Uh, I think there'll be a number of people. The last thing I agree with Cece, I don't. The last thing that Hillary Clinton wants to be is up on a stage by herself. She wants to have a forum to discuss ideas, and certainly where she has that forum, she's been very impressive. I've, a couple people here at Davos have talked about just how uh, question and answer situations, how adept and how thoughtful, and and how concise and and, and engaging she was. Uh, on the Republican side, I think. It's almost like Shakespeare. I want to have to figure out which play, and, and I'm not sure whether it's a tragedy or a comedy. But there, there are so so many so class two choices. <laughs> no, Shakespeare. I don't know. Is there something I missed? Midsummer's uh, Night Dream. Yeah, Shakespeare. Shakespeare didn't go deep into melodrama, um, but it it is so many strong personalities. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. So many uh, strong personalities uh, coming from different directions, and it is in, a, in an interesting way. A reflective tapestry of what of, of American politics, uh, and I, I mean that in a complimentary way. I think the both parties now have their extremes. Uh, of both parties are have have voice, and they are involved in the conversation. That that, that adds a level of complexity and interest that uh, for anyone, I think everyone's going to look at the next uh, you know 18 months and with wonder. <laughs> What a perfect note to end on, with wonder. Thank you so much. What a terrific conversation. And thank you to the audience. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you.